um, our first keynote speaker, Harald Valte. Um, Harald does not need an introduction. I um, mean, in he has a Wikipedia page, says Linux German hacker. And um, yeah, he's been a um, net filter maintainer, and I'm sure many other areas, uh, contributing many other areas in the Linux kernel. Um, my story of knowing Harold actually goes way back, about 17, 18 years. Uh, first, my first FOSS uh, conference in Bangalore, India. My second job, um, yeah, out of college, and uh, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's not a hint to calculate my age here, but uh, so yeah, I attribute. I only remember Harold's talk of that conference, and I attribute much of my uh, working in Linux and open source uh, to a journey with NetFilter, actually. So uh, yeah, and it was great meeting Harold in person after a long time um, in civil in one of the NetDev conferences. So yeah, like you, I am really excited to uh, listen to Harold today um, talk about NetFilter through the years. Yeah, over to Harold. Thanks. Going to be a bit of a tour. It's not. I, I try to be not one of the boring history teachers. They like, oh, in year 1999 this happened, and then that happened, and now you need to remember those dates. Um, I try to be a bit more exciting and have a bit more fun and entertainment in this talk. So what is it about? It's about NetFilter history, it's about NetFilter who is who, it's about NetFilter anecdotes, NetFilter folklore, and NetFilter world domination, of course. So, um, it's important to see a little bit of the context. Um, I mean, some of you have been around in Linux development or in Linux networking for many years. Some others uh, have not shared um, all this experience of the, well, 18 years that I'm going to cover. And for those, I'm going to give a little bit of context uh, as to what actually happened and when uh, and uh, what kind of time it was. So we're talking about the late 1990s. Uh, this is the last century. Um, the internet was still new to many people. Um, internet security was an extremely new topic, uh, well, to most people at least. We still had issues like the ping of death, not sure who remembers that one. Um, yeah, Jamal does, I know. Um, and uh, also in terms of the development process, we did not have Git yet. We did not have even Subversion. Um, we had CVS and we didn't even have BitKeeper yet at the time NetFilter started. So kernel releases were basically done by Linus taking in patches by email, applying them and releasing them as a tar archive every so often. That was how the development workflow was happening. And that's sort of the context on which we are starting this. Um, it's also a time in which many people did this really uh, even more than today uh, just for fun uh, and it was the commercial interest was there, it was the first dot-com bubble in the late 90s but still it was uh, a bit more enthusiasm I would say than uh, it is uh, at least for some people today. Um, uh, we also didn't have proper authorship annotation or commit history at the time because well if you have no revision control system, where would you have this uh, annotation? Um, also, in terms of development, we didn't have virtual machines. Uh, we had to test on physical boxes with lots of network interface cards and lots of cables uh, and lots of physical boxes. I still remember I had uh, like uh, servers in my kitchen because they were so noisy they would uh, disturb me in any other room of my apartment, so I put them in the kitchen where I spent the least time, uh, which says a lot about my uh, uh Nutrition. Anyway, so uh, we also had pre-net filter days. How was uh, packet filtering in net filter before? Um, so Linux 1.2, 1.3, and 2.0 had a program called IPFW ADM, the IP Firewalling Administration. Uh, it was developed by Jos Voss uh, from the Netherlands and some of his uh, compatriots. Um, and now my question is, who in the audience has still used that? Please raise your hand. Okay, so it's actually m much fewer people than I would have expected. Okay, yeah, so this is what I started to use when I did my first uh, experiments with uh, firewalling on Linux. Um, in 2.2 then we had IP chains, which was already developed by Rusty Russell, um, uh, who uh, I will introduce uh, shortly. Um, IP chains then, well, how many people in the room have used IP chains? Okay, many more. Okay, okay, okay. I see 
2.2 seems to be the the entry point for many of the people in the audience. Um, and the context for this is Rusty was doing um, system administration work at an internet service provider in uh, Australia and he was doing his job so well, uh, automatizing so many things that he had plenty of time to uh, work on uh, packet filtering and that's basically what got him into IP chains development. Um, and one of the other key things that really sparked Rusty into working on IP chains and net filter is, uh, and I just recently spoke to him and he reconfirmed that, was a talk by David Miller on beating the hell out of Solaris on Spark machines uh, at some point in the late 90s. And he said, you know, this is, this is the cool guys, I want to do something with them. This is where I can learn, this is where exciting technology happens. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, the kind of people I want to associate with. And uh, so that was a, a big motivational boost. He wanted to do more uh, Linux development. He met uh, a company called WatchGuard, which was back then, and I believe is still producing today, uh, firewall uh, appliances. And um, uh, they were kind enough uh, to fund Rusty for uh, doing a redesign of the Linux firewall. Uh, at that time it was IP chains was the, the existing uh, code and he wanted to do a proper redesign which then would be Netfilter IP tables um, if they would pay him for 6 to 12 months. His initial estimate was 6 months, in the end it took 12 months but they were kind enough to do so and he just basically had a free hand to do it whatever he thought was fit and what was the right thing to do. Um, so they did that and from mid-98 to mid-99 he hacked away on this new plan, on this new architecture of uh, packet filtering. So uh, let me introduce some of the people to you. Um, first of all, Rusty, who started the project. Um, I'm taking this from uh, one of the how-to documents he wrote. So um, I'm not going to read uh, the entire thing, but uh, well, he says, well, and always in his humble uh, manner, he's no kernel guru. He knows this because uh, his kernel work has brought him into contact with some of them some of them in this room. Um, so the, the real gurus are doing all the deep magic leaving Rusty to wait in the shallow end where it's safe. Um, and that's apparently the net filter code at the time at least. So in terms of timeline, July 98, Rusty posts the initial net filter design to the NetDev list. Well actually NetDev is incorrect, I think it was Linux Net at the time and NetDev did not even start yet, but Dave might be able to correct me on that. Um, in January 2999, NetFilter version 0 0.1 was released. Um, in August of the same year, NetFilter was merged into kernel 2315. To be more precise, it was 2315 pre 2. Um, and then the 2315 final release had it in there. Um, shortly after, a core team was established uh, with two members, Mark Boucher and Rusty. And I'm going to look at a couple of historic emails um, from that context. So. This is the uh, 99 uh, January mail where, uh, again, uh, I mean, it's just the, the humor in all of this is, is really uh, amazing. So uh, just in case all the people are sick of this stable kernel crap and want their interesting behavior back, there is a first alpha quality cut of my new firewall and so on and so on. So this is like the, the birth of NetFilter basically and this post uh, accompanies that. Um, just to get some historic context, in other news, Yahoo brought GeoCities at the time and Clinton faced his impeachment trial. So just to put this in historic context. Um, then the merge in August 99, um, uh, where uh, the actual changelog entry by Linus in the changelog is firewalling is gone again, replaced by an even more generic NetFilter facility. This is the first uh, commit log entry in the kernel change log and at that time East Timor becomes independent of Indonesia and Vladimir Putin becomes Prime Minister of Russia for the first time. Okay, and now if you're wondering how Rusty was looking like at the time, this is the oldest picture I could find from Rusty in my archives. It was at a, an event called Linux Beer Hike 2000. It happened in the UK. Um, and actually it was the first time I spent a significant amount of time with Rusty uh, hacking on NetFilter and other things. Um, and uh, to give you some more context how this uh, environment looked like in which we spent uh, part of our holidays. Uh, it looks like this and like that. <laughs> it was basically uh, a bunch of crazy Linux geeks uh, in the middle of the UK. 
the core team was established together with Mark Boucher, uh, whom you can find here. Uh, again, a picture from 2000, so uh, from this uh, historic context. And uh, the core team is basically the, the group of people who uh, feels uh, well more uh, responsible than, than probably others. Uh, it's not uh, really uh, officially defined uh, what the, the, the rules are and so on. I'm just going to introduce a couple of people to you. I'm um, not going to read this now, but we'll, we'll have a look individually at those. So for James Morris, I don't have any older picture from, from the exact, exact historic context. So this is a, a picture I could find. Um, uh, also, again, the humor, I think, is something that made uh, the project live at the time. It's not just the humor in the announcements or in the documentation. There's also lots of humor in the source code. Unfortunately, a lot of this has been sort of phased out uh, due to subsequent uh, changes in the kernel. But if you read original NetFilter code, then you find comments like, Welcome, Mr. Bond, I've been expecting you which is basically when a so-called connection tracking expect is invoked. And then if uh, you look at, uh, there's all these you know, IP tables, uh, and filter table, NAT table, and many other tables, and then Rusty put a comment in there somewhere, furniture shopping, because there's so many tables involved. So there were all these funny comments and the funny, uh, the, the, you know, the humorous posts, and now I'm just going to read this, because uh, part of this, because it's so funny. So it was the dawn of the third age of Linux firewalling, the third age, because I IPFW, ADM, and IP chains before. A time of great struggle and heroic deeds. It was our last best hope for peace. Great communities were fo founded, old civilizations were lost, and new alliances were formed. Um, James' missions during this period included the continued perversion of the networking code, and so on, to inflict grave terror upon unsuspecting SNMP packets, and to expand the IP stack into user space with Perl. Now peering squarely into the abyss, we noticed the good deeds of a young colonel warrior named Harald Welte, who seemed to actually understand the NAT code. Accordingly, his distinctiveness was added to the collective. With balance restored, the NAT filter juggernaut was now free to accelerate into the brave new world of Linux 2.4 and so on. And this is sort of like really the official uh, kind of announcement about core team members joining and so on. Anyway, to put some historical context. Um, at the same time, Bill Gates stepped down as CEO. Uh, we don't claim any uh, causality in that. Um, <laughs> and this is how I was looking like at that time. So, uh, hard to imagine, but yes. Okay, yeah, so, more funny pictures. Okay, next to enter the NetFilter project, or the NetFilter core team, was Yusef. Um, in December 2001, Yusef looks like this. He hasn't really changed much ever since, uh, probably because also he was uh, not as young as any of the other people involved at the time. Um, he, is, he was and is a physicist at the Hungarian Physics Research Institute. Um, he did lots of sysadmin work there. And uh, well, by the way, um, what's it with sy physicists and Linux kernel networking? And uh, there's another famous developer called Alexei Kuznetsov, who some of you may remember, at least from comments in the code or from, from uh, comments on the mailing list. Uh, so physicists from former Eastern Bloc countries hacking away on the kernel networking code, there must be some conspiracy. Um, he did lots of work on connection tracking, for example, the TCP window tracking, and he's still active today. Um, Again, um, sort of to put this in historic context, um, around the same time 2.4.0 was released, the first stable kernel that includes NetFilter IP tables. And also, in at around the same time, Enron files Chapter 11 bankruptcy, for those who follow US uh, economic uh, news. Also, the United Nations authorizes the uh, IS ISAF in, in Afghanistan post the 9-11 attacks in that year. President Karzai is elected to lead the Afghan interim administration. Um, okay, um, interludium here. So um, uh, one thing that I thought was particularly important in, uh, for example, enabling me and others to join early in the NetFilter development is documentation. And um, I know it's always hard for developers. You know, you can continue to write some great code and you can add more features and so on. But on the other hand, having 
good documentation both for developers and users is absolutely important in order to enable quick growth of a project and to enable more people to enter it and it to me it has helped a lot and everyone else I spoke to the the how to's that were there early in the project have helped enormously to get people involved and and to to make quick progress another funny thing we had in netfilter was called the netfilter scoreboard uh, which is basically a high score for a number of patches and contributions. Um, so uh, uh, today people would call this probably gamification. Um, and of course you have all those statistics automatically in the git commit log and uh, people like uh, John Corbett at LWN and others are creating statistics about who changed how much of the kernel. But back then this didn't really exist and all the tools did not exist. This looked like this. So on the web page we had this scoreboard. Um, this is the main overview uh, picture with like the top contributors who uh, contributed something and the score next to them. It's a high score. And would when you click on one of those individual links, then you actually get a page like this, which shows you the contributions of uh, this particular person, uh, Andras Kischavo. Um, and uh, then you see like what points for what. Um, so we had different uh, number of points for different things. So if you submitted the patch in correct form, there was a bonus point, uh, an extra bonus point, um, and uh, then uh, five points for a bug fix and so many points for a patch. And there were also interesting records like zero points for nothing uh, in this line. <laughs> yeah, uh, people with uh, too much time at their hands at that time, I guess. Um, another key part, I think, of NetFilter is the modularity and extensibility. So in the end, the core NetFilter is just a couple of hooks in the stack, as I think most people know. Um, and IP tables was there to match uh, packets and so on. And uh, there were match and target plugins in uh, the NetFilter and IP tables code. And um, together with the good API documentation, lots of people got involved in developing their own favorite uh, plugin or uh, module for IP tables. And now the problem was how to distribute them and how to maintain them because a lot of them were out of mainline and probably will continue or would continue to stay out of mainline because they're such, such an obscure thing that you don't want as a general feature in the kernel. So we created something called Patchomatic. Um, not sure how many in here remember Patchomatic. Okay, very few. So Patchomatic was basically a collection of um, NetFilter or particularly IP tables extensions. Um, and you could basically uh, run it like here uh, indicated on this announcement or the readme text. You have this run me script uh, and you prompt, uh, you give it where your kernel sources are. And then you can select which of the IP tables extensions you want to apply and you want to patch into that kernel. Basically, it, it solved the problem of having clashes in make files in kconfig and, and all that stuff that you would normally have if you have many patches touching the same part of code. Um, so that was our solution or for the problem and uh, we didn't really check what went in there. So we ended up with interesting posts like this where, um, well, at that time Daniel Stone said, well, uh, I see a problem uh, and something is not working in Patchomatic and it means A, it has not received any testing at all or B, it was a mispaste, uh, so some, some problem with the patch. And then Rusty responds, completely untested. And Patchomatic is uh, for getting stuff out there without waiting for the Rusty Linus planet alignment thing. So um, that was the uh, basically a, a complete collection of some useful and some not so useful things, but it was a, a method how people could get their um, module and their extension out there and distribute it and, and usable for people. Um, so the combination to the success, I think, is the documentation, the modular framework, and uh, the, the way how to maintain those patches. Also keep in mind, this was a time when many more people compiled their own kernels. Uh, this was uh, a different time than today. Um, I mean, I think we probably had 10% of the kconfig options that we have today. Um, and I'm saying that uh, from the NetFilter point of view, which has more kconfig options than probably any other part of networking. Um, yeah, so we have Martin Josefsson joining the core team. Um, we have the 2.6 kernel being released also around the same time. Uh, the uh, People's Republic of North Korea withdraws from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the US Space Shuttle crashes and the US launches war on Iraq and Saddam Hussein is captured. None of these events are in any causality with NetFilter development. 
And in 2003, we also see some interesting messages from a brave new young warrior called Pablo Neira. Um, well, I'm not going to read through all of this. This is the first email from him ever on the Netflix list, and this is like this really, really nice piece of code. And then we see the next message from him, and you see, P.S., thanks for this great piece of code. So it seems he had, uh, from day one, an enormous appreciation for the code, for whatever reason. He can explain that himself. Um, he does not become a member of the core team at that point. Uh, first, we have Patrick McCarty, who joins the core team. Um, uh, has uh, recently been uh, removed from the core team due to uh, uh, non-technical uh, issues and uh, license enforcement that people didn't agree. Historic context for 2004 is Facebook was born and the Bluetooth 2.0 spec has been released and Skype becomes popular. Um, okay, at that time also we introduced Netfilter core team emeritus members, um, which uh, according to Rusty is Latin for burned out free riding slacker. Um, that's the uh, uh, the description. So, and a little bit of background on that. So, at until recently, I actually thought well, Rusty basically just disappeared because there were so many other tempting and distracting projects. He was rewriting the kernel module loader. He was working on QMU. He was working on parallel virtualization and all kinds of other things that you know are all very important and and uh, definitely needed attention. So I thought it was just you know too many tasks at hand. Recently, however, Rusty told me it was a deliberate decision at the time to leave Netfilter and uh, it was a strategic decision because he sa thought the new core team and maintainers should run the project without interference from like, the project father. You know, if you always have the, like, the old guy around, um, the kids have to stand on their own feet at some point and uh, you have to basically pull out and let them do what they want to do uh, without uh, being this uh, father figure in the background all the time. So that's basically he why, why, he's why he disappeared uh, rather quickly and rather completely from the project. Next, we have Yasuyuki Kosakai. Um, he is, uh, was a member of the Japanese Usagi project for Linux IPv6. Um, he worked on, well, unsurprisingly, many IPv6 related features, among them IPv6 connection tracking, which we didn't have until that point. Um, in 2007, we have Pablo joining the core team. Um, and uh, this is how Pablo looked at the time. Uh, slightly different than today, but not as different as I did uh, back then. Um, he's uh, the official head of the core team since 2013, known as a jack of all trades. Um, and uh, for fairness sake, actually, I, there should be a picture here, but it's not there. I'm sorry. I wanted to show also a picture from me at that time, since I'm showing old pictures of other people. Somehow the picture disappeared from the slide. Historical context, well, Obama is inaugurated for the first time. We have the configure virus infecting 9.5 million PCs. Michael Jackson died, and Google starts Chrome OS. Um, another thing that happened in 2009 is NF tables. The first version of NF tables came out. Um, and um, it was sort of the fourth generation of Linux kernel packet filtering. But as you could see, IPFW ADM was very short-lived. IP chains was rather short-lived. IP tables has lived for a very long time, and even 2009 it was not replaced. It took another four years until it went mainline, and I still think the majority of the firewalls today are running IP tables. So the cycles are getting longer, and uh, Linear iteration of, of linked lists uh, with packets apparently still is sufficient for a lot of applications and use cases, otherwise people wouldn't do it. Fast forward 2012, um, we have Eric LeBlanc and Florian Westphal joining. Um, some references to the many contributions uh, that people have uh, made. Um, also in 2012, uh, a lot of the former Core team members uh, enter emeritus state, including myself. Um, historical context, well, lots of retaliations of different war parties. Um, and we have the great patent war of Apple versus Samsung. And mega upload gets shut down in 2012. Um, NF tables, yeah. So in 2013, NF tables finally gets merged into mainline. Um, we have this uh, following commit. And well, I think you cannot really see it here on the projector, but this uh, bubble, like the speech bubble, actually says bye bye IP tables in that picture. So, um, yeah, we're finally at a point where IP tables uh, can become legacy and can uh, be phased out slowly and replaced by a more generic framework. 
Um, now, after all this history part, uh, let me also talk a bit about bugs and some topics that I think are uh, particularly problematic uh, or worth mentioning. So, of course, we had bugs, like anyone had bugs. Uh, the problem is, of course, NetFlitter bugs tend to affect uh, security in a quite uh, significant way. Um, uh, and uh, well, we had some, some issues and so on, and then we see, uh, again, some uh, very rusty-like uh, responses. So, um, yeah, I'm a fucking retard. Well, not many people would say that about themselves. I think it's a uh, uh, quite special way of uh, um, responding to, to bugs. Um, Rusty's response to, to, to bugs was he created NFSIM, the NetFilter simulator, and a test suit. And the problem with this is that, well, um, you have a lot of code, of course, and you need automatic testing. So the NetFilter simulator tried to run lots of NetFilter and other kernel code in user space uh, together with a test suite and then wrappers for all the user space tools, simulate allocation failures and so on. In general, it's a very good idea and was lots of useful work. Um, uh, the problem is reality sucks. So very few contributions to that test suite. Very few users beyond the original authors, uh, Rusty and Jeremy. Uh, very limited adoption and use by other NetFilter developers. Um, and then, well, still we see uh, discussions about this. So uh, here Patrick says, well, I spent 10 hours to verify proposed fixes, manually, of course. And then Rusty says, well, this is why we need an automatic test suit. Um, so uh, the test suit would have run in five seconds if you had implemented a test case against the test suit. So you see a uh, useful tool, but other developers didn't really adopt it. And reality sucks even more um, because the patches then sometimes get validated only in the test suit and not in the real kernel anymore, uh, which leads to an upset David Miller, which says, well, uh, I really think they were not ready, the patches, and so on and so on. Um, yeah. And FSIM is becoming particularly a crutch because I know this is what Rusty and others use heavily for testing, which is fine, but if your patches break the build in many ways in the real kernel tree and so on, you're relying too much on the simulator. So nice idea, but reality sucks. So we have very few contributions, very limited adoption. We have bit rot of the kernel environment simulation inside um, the NET filter simulation. Uh, for example, new uh, f features that we used like uh, NF netlink, CT netlink, and so on, they all were not present in the simulator. Um, so I think by 2008 it was abandoned and there were no uh, continued uh, patches or maintenance of it. And until today, we have no replacement and successor. Um, and uh, that uh, is something that I find particularly a pity, so all we can do is we can join David in praying uh, that the code is correct. Um, yeah, so um, some more humor, uh, some more anecdotes that I picked out. So here, um, uh, Josef is finding some patches that Rusty didn't complete. And um, uh, Josef asks, well, are you still going to complete this or can I pick up or should I pick up? And, Josef, uh, and then Rusty says, well, let me put it this way take over those patches and I will name my first child after you. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this did not happen. So, um, and Rusty's comment is, oh, unfortunately, it's rather complicated to change the name of a child in Australia. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, also some interesting other funny anecdotes. This was me in 2003. Um, somebody was asking whether there are plans to incorporate NAT into IP6 tables or the future packet tables. We, we didn't call it NF tables then, it was an idea about something called packet tables. And I said, over my dead body, NAT is what broke IPv4 end to end. Let's not do the same with IPv6. The only reasonable application is IPv4 to IPv6 transition NAT. Um, luckily, by the time IPv6 NAT support was merged, I was no longer active. So. <laughs> I didn't have to kill myself or nobody else has to kill myself. I still think it's horrible and I would rather have avoided it, but well, um, it wasn't my call at the time. Um, yeah, another thing that we had uh, rather successfully was NetFilter workshops. Uh, in the beginning, the first couple of years, there were more informal meetings. I mean, it was two or three people. There's no real need to make a, lot a ra rather large workshop. Uh, from 2001 onwards, we established workshops where developers uh, meet up, um, not every year, but we had 13 workshops in 18 years. Um, the invitation only, similar to the uh, 
uh, NetDevConf, not NetDev, uh, uh, no, NetConf, NetConf uh, uh, event. Um, and uh, done by community for the community. We had always very generous support from commercial uh, NetFilter users in terms of sponsoring. Um, this is the list of uh, workshops that we held uh, so far. A couple of group pictures. Um, some of those, like this one, uh, are rather low resolution, as digital cameras at the time weren't really all that great. Um, you can see uh, uh, hairstyles changing over the years. Also, fun fact, in the 2005 workshop in Seville, actually, we saw these fire extinguishers at the event venue, which were of the brand Unix. So we thought, well, firewalling on Linux at a workshop, and we have Unix fire extinguishers at the venue. Um, this can't get much better than that. Um, yeah, more workshop pictures from various different workshops, more recent ones. Uh, you will recognize the people more on the more recent pictures. In 2015, as context, kernel 4.0 is released uh, with NetFilter IP tables and NF tables, uh, finally, um, 2016. And uh, yeah, so what kind of challenges do we have? Um, or did we have? Uh, of course, many challenges. One of the funnier parts, I think, was uh, originally the IP tables kernel code did not validate the rule set integrity because at the time we said, well, if somebody loads an IP tables rule set into the kernel, he has to have capnet admin anyway. So basically, his root, he owns the machine. So if he wants to break his machine, that's his own, you know, business. Um, it's not our job to protect him against ins inserting a rule set that has, I don't know, like endless loops or, or other crashes. Um, unfortunately, this broke when people thought uh, they uh, want to have unprivileged containers with uh, UID mappings. So now you can create a, a, a container, a, a namespace uh, where root is no longer root, at least not on the host machine. And you are uh, able to load rules uh, and uh, you can crash the entire system. So. Uh, some of those things had to be reworked, um, and uh, I think this was one of the early architectural um, or conceptual issues that uh, nobody could anticipate at the time, so a lot of validation code had to be added. Also some fun facts about NetFilter.org infrastructure. Um, we did self-hosting of all the infrastructure for a long time, and it's still mostly the case. Um, except the mailing lists have moved to Vigor, um, uh, otherwise it's that. The firewall machine in front of NetFilter.org infrastructure was for many years IP tables on Linux on UltraSpark. Um, why? Well, because we can and because script kitties don't do Spark assembly in general. So, um, of course, there was a time when uh, people found it particularly attractive to try to hack NetFilter.org because it's like a target where you can, uh, like a high value target, if you can hack NetFilter, you know, then, then you're the really ki cool kid. Um, and the actual web servers and uh, mail servers and so on were for a long time uh, PowerPC based machines, again, for the same reason, just to add a layer of obscurity for the people who uh, had fun. Okay, brings us to the summary. Why uh, do I think NetFilter was successful? I think one of the key facts is that some smart people got funded to implement things the way they want. Um, that was a key aspect, I think, uh, in, in getting the architecture right. Uh, extensible architecture from day one, uh, interfaces for plugins, um, good documentation on how you write such plugins. And I mean, Rusty did not only write documentation on how to write NetFilter extensions, but he wrote a how-to on networking concepts and, and you know, m much more fundamental things. And a kernel locking guide, the Rusty's unreliable kernel locking guide to understand how to handle the locking when you write such modules and so on. So it was really, I think, a, a key part. Um, we had a couple of passionate developers who picked NetFilter as their own topic of interest. It's not because somebody gave them an assignment or something like that. Um, yeah, so any regrets? Well, um, of course I have a regret that I don't have time for NetFilter work anymore, but there's too many other things to do um, and uh, lots of good people taking care of NetFilter. I should have stepped down sooner, as Rusty did, uh, as the official, like as a core team member, uh, giving Pablo and Patrick at the time more credit. So that uh, I regret. Um, I also regret that contract and net helpers are still in kernel space. I mean, I think for about ten years or longer, we have the infrastructure of doing them in user space, but then still, in reality, they are implemented in the kernel. 
Um, uh, the CT Netlink helper infrastructure is there, but I don't think it's very popular. So we still have ASN1 parsing in the SNMP NAT helper and 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 SIP uh, NAT helpers and and H323 NAT helpers in the kernel, which make me uneasy. Um, we still have people that think they need dynamic, fully dynamic IPv6 to IPv6 network address and port translation, um, which, uh, well, okay, I can only have regret about that. I can't do anything about it. And we have no replacement for the NetFilter simulator, um, which means the NetFilter code remains largely without tests, well, without automatic tests at least. Sure, there is unit tests and so on in NF tables in user space and in other parts, but the actual kernel code, including all the connection tracking and NAT code, does not have automatic regression tests, and that uh, I think is a rather sad state. I know in the kernel it's sort of a different culture than in some other projects, and in the kernel you have millions or billions of, of, of users out there, and, and you basically rely on the fact that there are some early adopters who will run into the bugs and report them so you can fix them. But I think especially with something like as complex as NetFilter, um, I'm not sure uh, how, how long it actually takes until somebody finds bugs uh, in, 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 in parts of the code. So with the size and relevance of the Linux industry in 2017, uh, I'm a bit surprised why people don't invest in automatic test suits uh, to really uh, validate that you're sure. I mean, in, in other projects that I'm involved in now these days, um, and also with age, of course, over time you look at things differently. Um, I have basically have the attitude, well, if a feature is not automatically tested, it's of very little use. Uh, only if you can automatically validate it, you can be sure that it does what it does and it continues to do what it's supposed to do. Um, and in absence of that, it's, um, yeah, you know, how often does somebody do a manual test and so on. Another regret uh, I have in technically is uh, that uh, we should have pushed more for, for user space logging in firewalling. Uh, ULogD, I, I wrote the first version in 2000, I think, and 17 years later still a lot of people are doing syslog-based logging from packet filter rules with uh, string printf in the kernel and yeah, okay, it's not elegant, but then if that's what people want, and I think we, should, we could have more pushed a bit more. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to the audience for bearing with me. Uh, thanks to the NetDev committee for inviting me to give this keynote. Thanks for Rusty, uh, to Rusty for being my hero at the time uh, as a youngster uh, um, getting into kernel development. To Pablo for picking up the pieces when I left. Uh, to Dave for being everyone's hero, including Rusty's hero. Uh, to Jasper for a lot of the pictures I used here um, without giving him proper credit on each of the page. And uh, to every single NetFilter contributor out there for making us what we are today. Thank you. Any, uh, we have five minutes. Anybody wants to ask, say something?